everyone and welcome! Today I am going to be covering a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, that of tailoring. We're going to be going through all of the different supplies that you will need in order to do different time periods of historical and pretty much modern tailoring as well, because I know that the list of ingredients is incredibly long and confusing, so we're going to cover all of that. I'm going to put links down below for a lot of the supplies that I'm talking about. Most of those are going to be for US-based tailoring supply shops, however I will have a few links to places outside of the US, and if you have any recommendations I would love to hear them and may put those down below in the future as well. In reality though, this video is my excuse to go on for a while about why you should not be using horsehair fabric for everything in tailoring because no, just stop. <laughs> I know this is a really common thing, so if you have used it for a wide variety of things don't feel bad, it's just there are so many better options. And if you've had a tough time of tailoring while using it, it may be the horsehair's fault, not yours. So. First things first, since we're on that topic, let's talk about interfacings. The first interfacing that I really want to get into is that of buckram or linen canvas, because they are one and the same in many ways. So buckram specifically, historically, is a plain weave linen which has been stiffened by way of glazing or gum tragicanth, gum arabic some sort of paste, basically it has been stiffened in some format. You also have plain linen canvas which may not have been stiffened as much or may not have been stiffened at all, but they are both plain weave linen canvases in their base element. This is what I want to see everyone using all of the time for like all of the things. If you're looking at say 18th century menswear, buckram, don't put other stuff in there, buckram. <laughs> If you're looking at 19th century menswear, buckram, if you're looking at 20th century menswear, same sort of linen canvas, it is useful in waistcoats, it is useful in coats, it is a great waistband for your trousers, it is useful in women's tailored pieces or just in women's wear in general. It can also be good for collars. Now there are stiffer options available for collars, collar canvas is a very specific thing, and this is very much like that linen canvas, it's just much stiffer. And so it works really well with those high collars or very crisp and clean collars. I do also want to make a note that buckram, as I'm talking about it, is not modern millinery buckram. That is a very different thing that is sort of the same background, but it's usually much looser of a weave, it has a lot of space between the threads and it's usually far stiffer than you need. So we're not talking about modern millinery buckram, we're talking about historic linen canvas buckram and the umbrella of linen canvas that I really, really love. I use it in every single part of my garments and it is the first thing I reach for unless I need something specifically different. So if we're using linen canvas for so many things, what do we actually use hair canvas for? You most often see hair canvas used along with other layers in the chest area of a coat, something that has a fair amount of tailoring in it. The key factor here is that it is not on its own and that it is sandwiched in between layers. So it is used just in that chest area, it does not extend into the lapel, it does not go all the way down the length of your coat, it kind of stops right at the lower part of the chest. It also doesn't go over towards the arm side nearly as far as the linen canvas will. It is essentially just pad stitched to that linen canvas and then you will run a tailor's tape, which we'll talk about in a little bit, around all of those edges. You have to do this because hair canvas is made of horsehair running in the weft and horsehair is very stiff, which is great, but it's also very stabby and it will work its way through your fabrics if you don't properly contain it. This is one of the reasons why you shouldn't overuse it. It is springier than you need for most things, it is springier than you need for your lapels and your collars in most cases, and it's just difficult to fight with because you really have to finish off all of those edges properly so it doesn't work its way through the clothing and end up jabbing you in the shoulder. So use it in limited places. There's a right time and a wrong time but I'm generally gonna say use linen canvas more often. Along this note, one of the others that you're going to regularly see on modern tailoring sites is Hymo canvas. Hymo isn't specifically horsehair or non-horsehair, it actually is a whole range of different weights and different types of canvas. So for example, the plain linen canvas that I tend to use 
is technically labeled as a Hymo, but I've also purchased horsehair Hymo canvas. I've purchased really heavy and really lightweight versions. So it's just a whole range of different types of canvas. But it is a really good search term if you're trying to find websites that carry tailoring supplies because it's not a word that gets used by any other place. In addition to this list, of course, if you've watched almost any of my other videos is beetled linen, also sometimes called glazed linen. And it is a type of linen that is a plain weave that has been essentially beaten by mallets for a very long time, meaning that it's very stiff, very lightweight, very, very crisp and so easy to use. It has a glaze to it, though it's not actually glazed, that will never really go away. So even when I'm looking at 18th century shoe linings where there's been a lot of abrasion, still shiny, it's really impressive. But I have found this beetled linen in lots of different tailored pieces over the years. I in fact just found it in my arsenic green 1850s jacket in the sleeves, so that was really cool. And I particularly love this stuff because it doesn't add any bulk, but it is very stiff and gives you a nice clean edge. Additionally, if you are dealing with a heavily tailored garment with all that pad stitching and taping and all of the ridges that come with that, you will probably also want Domet. Domet is a very lightweight sort of felted fabric that lays over all of that pad stitching and smooths it out. This is particularly useful if you have a silk or satin lapel, or if you have a very lightweight wool. It also adds a really nice weight to the overall garment and a luxuriousness from just the thickness without actually adding weight. So I really highly recommend the use of that. On the lighter end of the scale, we also have a variety of other types of lightweight canvases and interfacings that go into things like your shirt collars and sleeves. One of the terms for this is Wigan, and you will find it being used very commonly in women's vintage suits. I found it listed over and over and over again in the tailoring manuals for that particular sort of 1920s through 1950s range. So I find that to be a very useful thing to keep around because if I don't need a lot of structure, but I need a little bit of something, it's sort of the weight equivalent of that iron-on interfacing that we've all had experience with, which I'm not even really going to talk about today because I don't qualify that as a actual good way to do interfacing. I come from a theater background. I totally understand where it is useful, but avoid it if you can. It's fast, but it's not better. That's sort of the way I tend to think of a lot of those things. Because the iron-on adhesive isn't a 100% guaranteed thing, and if you wash the garment, or if it goes through a lot of wear and tear, it can actually detach and crumple up, and then you have to get back inside of that thing, and that's just, that's not worth your time. Moving on then to other items, inside of the garment, we're going to deal with padding next. So there are a few places that wadding or padding are very common historically. The first and foremost place is sort of right here in the chest area. This is a place where there's very often a hollow, especially for some of the time periods where they really want a very nice rounded chest. So putting in some wool or cotton batting in that area and just sort of tacking it down loosely is very common, not only in men's tailored garments, but in women's garments in general. So you see it in women's gowns as well as tailored pieces. And it's a very useful way to fill out that space if you have gaps around the arms or gaps around that sort of chest neck area. So that's very common. You don't see shoulder pads very commonly until we're getting closer to the end of the 19th century for menswear. The point that shoulder pads really take off is the 1930s. Women actually start that trend before the men, by the way, but that is a whole nother video for a whole nother day. And those shoulder pads at that era start to get very lofty. Earlier shoulder pads are very thin. If they're there at all, they're more often used if the shoulders of the person are very sloped, but the style is not. Or if the person has uneven shoulders, then you can pad one out so that way it looks even on the exterior. Padding really starts as a way to fix the body where it has deficiencies according to the current fashions. It's not necessarily meant to be an extreme format of structure until later. The one place you do very regularly see padding in the shoulder area though is in the sleeve head. So this area right here on your shoulders does need padding depending on the time period. If you're say looking at 1830s menswear, there is a huge amount of fullness at the top. It really helps to have something to help loft that out. But you see it consistently throughout the 19th and 20th centuries and you just see a variety of different types of rolls of cotton or wool batting depending on the size and the type of structure needed. 
So you may not need a lot, and if you're, say, doing 18th century, you don't want any because that's way up on the shoulders and you don't need lift and loft to the sleeve heads. So this is more a matter of aesthetics, and even in modern suits, there are a whole bunch of different styles for sleeve wadding, depending on the type of sleeve head that you want. So there's not one right way to do that, but that might be a better answer than giant shoulder pads if you're trying to deal with deflating areas of the shoulders. Next up on our interiors list, we get into all the little extra bits like Taylor's tape. Taylor's tape specifically is a plain woven tape. It is usually cotton, but the important thing is that it's plain woven, not twill woven, not a twill tape, because twill tape has some stretch and give. Plain weave does not, and the main purpose of Taylor's tape is to lay down along the edges and the fold lines of your garment so that way they do not stretch. You can't cut your entire garment on the straight of grain. Some of it's going to be on the bias. It's going to be cut on the angle where there's some stretch. And this is particularly true when you're thinking about lapels. So this area called the bridle is really where you're going to very much want to have that really unstretchy Taylor's tape that kind of gets pulled in a little bit and make sure that this sits nice and close to the body. The Taylor's tape, if you've watched my video about making this vest, also goes around all of those edges on the exterior so that way they're nice and clean and crisp and they aren't going to stretch no matter what angle you've cut them on. So it's very useful in lots of different places. I honestly just usually go and buy a big roll of it and then I use that for so many different applications. <laughs> the other sort of strip reinforcement that you will see used inside of Taylor garments is that of Petersham. So Petersham is similar to Grosgrain ribbon, they just have different edges, whether it's a straight edge or a sort of scalloped curve edge. And Petersham is regularly used as, say, a waistband interfacing. It's also used for hat bands, so it's just very good as a sturdy and strong way of finishing off the interior of your waistbands really fast because you don't have to deal with finishing off edges. And you can actually iron it to have a curve, which is really great if you have certain time periods where they do have a curved yoke or a curved waistband to the top. So again, highly useful in lots of different applications, not just in tailoring. One of the things that you will see more modern day tailors using occasionally is waistbanding, and this is something where it's just a plain weave cotton with some sort of rubber strippings on it. And that's meant to function like the Petersham did historically in say early 20th century menswear. And I have tried it before, but I don't really like it. it works really fast, but it is not something that historically at least was used. Next up, we're talking about fabrics for all of those extra bits like pocketing or lining materials. So pocketing specifically is something that you use for pockets, not surprisingly, and usually you want something there that is a plain weave or it can be a twill weave cotton, but you just want something that is nice, lightweight, stiff, doesn't stretch, doesn't give or flex in all sorts of different ways. And the less it frays, the better, but that's not as important of a thing. I use glazed cotton a lot for my pockets and those sorts of linings. You can also use the same sort of fabric in your sleeve linings. If you don't want these super shiny, slick linings that you see inside of most modern coats in your sleeves, a cotton lining is great there. You can also use cotton lining for the entire body of your coat and the rest of your garments. That's something that would be really typical for, say, the 19th century menswear. Another option for lining in terms of more historical purposes is, of course, silk. A silk taffeta or a watered silk or a silk satin is also something that you regularly see used throughout the different centuries for internal linings. This is sort of approximated in modern day by the use of polyester or rayon linings. I generally avoid polyester linings if I can. I will sometimes use rayon. So rayon Bemberg, which is a specific brand name of rayon, as well as other types of rayons are still fairly breathable, at least to me more so than polyester is. However, I just generally will avoid using those unless I know I'm gonna have layers between me and the garment. So I might use it on say the back of a vest, but I will try and avoid using it on the interior parts of my trousers because that's where things get sticky and sweaty and and I'd much rather have a cotton or a linen up against that part of my body than something that's going to cling. 
So yeah, that's my recommendation on linings. And I'm also going to put in Melton or under collar felt here. So what you will find is that on the underside of collars, say in the 19th and 20th centuries for menswear, and it's not for everything, but for some things, you will find a heavy wool fabric used, which is a felted fabric. So it can have a cut edge, meaning that you don't have to worry about actually finishing the edge. It won't fray at all. You don't have to fold it under. And that's something that provides a nice sturdy, stiff under collar base, but doesn't add bulk because you don't have to fold over the edges. Which actually leads us really well into our next topic of just wools in general. What sort of fabrics can you use for tailoring? I do have to say I'm not going to get into linens and silks and cottons and all that stuff that is extensive, but we're going to specifically focus in on wools because that tends to be the most typical type of tailoring fabric when it comes to your exterior garments. And I personally think one of the ones that has some of the most confusing terminology and options, and it just seems like something that really needs to be covered. So as we were just talking about that Melton that has a nice cut edge that you don't have to worry about fraying, we also have broadcloth. And that is the same sort of thing. It is a heavier weight wool. It doesn't have to be super heavy, but it can be very heavyweight, it can be more of a mid-weight, and the key thing here is that they are felted so that way you can cut the edge and leave it raw. This is really commonly used in military uniforms. So throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, this is the most typical fabric that you see for men's military uniforms. And honestly, I'm pretty sure it's still used well into the 20th century too, because it's so easy to deal with and requires a lot less concern and work than dealing with raw edges that will fray out. These are all under the umbrella of what we call coatings, which is just heavier wools. So on the scale of heavy to light, coatings are kind of your heaviest range. There's still a wide variety within that, but they're pretty straightforward in terms of this is what you use for coats, this is what you use for outerwear. You can, say, make 18th century menswear completely out of broadcloth, but it's not super lightweight. You will see determinations like fine, super fine, things like that, that's not a determination of weight. That's a determination of how fine the threads are, therefore how tightly packed that is. We'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. Next down in terms of weight, one of the typical types of wool that you're going to regularly see is tweed, like I have on. Tweed specifically is something that has a sort of mottled or mixed color palette to it. It's because they will actually mix in other colors of wool along with the base color for the thread, so you will end up with a mottled texture. Now, there are plenty of other wool suitings that are in this weight range, so it doesn't have to specifically be tweed in order to get this sort of mid-weight wool, but this is sort of my ideal weight. This is the stuff that I really love working with because it works for warmer weather as well as cooler weather. It's what we traditionally think of as that standard English suit and it's that general weight. And very often you will see it termed suiting without much else to it. I don't really feel comfortable saying that's what suiting is because if you go to lots of different fabric websites, they'll just have so many things under suiting. It's just basically saying anything that's appropriate for a suit according to our opinion. And that's a lot of things. So suiting is not something that is used as a specific definition often enough for me to tell you that that's what that weight is. If you go to a really nice tailoring store, this generally seems to be about the weight of suitings, and that's what I typically see for a lot of menswear throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Those vintage men's suits are very often this harder finish, a bit crisper hand, a bit rougher finish to it, and that's really what we're looking for in terms of what my opinion is the best suiting for a wide variety of things. It's not to say that you don't sometimes want to use broadcloth or that you can't use lighter weight things. That's just my personal preferred suiting weight. Next down the list, we are getting into worsted wools or what very often today is termed a super fine. You will also see a number next to that super fine label, usually anywhere from 100 to about 250 now, and that is referring to the fineness of those threads that we mentioned. So 100 is a thicker thread, 250 is a very thin, very fine thread, and that's just going to be not unlike when you're looking at sheets and thread count for those. Specifically though, super fine is a worsted wool, 
Worsted is a type of wool that has been spun very, very tightly in its thread format. And so you end up with a very smooth finish. It's not fuzzy or furry. It's very smooth and can honestly even look shiny. It can be a plain weave or a twill weave, but the key thing is just the twist that goes into that thread and therefore the overall finish of the wool. This is usually somewhere in that mid to lighter weight area. However, there are lighter weight wools called tropical wools in modern terminology. And I generally avoid those for most things. You will see me using that fabric when I'm say making my general everyday trousers. That's where I really like to use that sort of wool, but I just don't like it for most of my historical tailoring purposes. I haven't seen that particular weight of wool used historically or really for vintage very often. It's just more difficult to deal with if you're doing a lot of tailoring. It shows all the lumps and bumps. It shows all of your mistakes really easily. It's not very forgiving. You can't do a lot of shaping to it and it's going to show everything underneath too. So that's basically the wool that can give you panty lines. So is it useful? Yeah. Should you use it? maybe not as often as the other wools. And just because something is lighter weight doesn't mean that it's better for hotter weather. I know they call it tropical wool for a reason, but in reality, wool can be fairly breathable. It depends more on the weave of your wool and the finish of your wool than it does just the overall weight as to whether you feel hot or not in your wool. So it can be very breathable in lots of different weights. And honestly, it's great because it doesn't smell, it doesn't hold moisture, and just in general, it's a very pleasant all-around fabric, no matter what time of the year and what climate you're dealing with. The final important ingredient to your tailoring is going to be your threads. One of the things that you will find specifically sold for tailoring purposes is basting thread. Now, you can really use just about any thread for basting, I know I do in a pinch, but basting thread is far superior in the fact that it's very smooth. So it's really easy to do big stitches really quickly. It's very easy to pull out of your garment once you're done with those basting stitches and it snaps pretty easily, which is not a feature that you want in your regular threads. But when you're pulling out basting threads and you might've accidentally stitched through them, you want them to snap really easily. So you don't have to go through and individually cut and pull out every single little tiny bit of thread. Trust me on this, it will make your life much easier and everything will go much faster. <laughs> so that I highly recommend as investment if you're doing any sort of historical sewing, not just tailoring because basting is a way of life when you're hand sewing. In terms of the threads that you're actually using to do your hand sewing on tailored garments, I will always recommend silk threads. There are three different weights that you're going to regularly see. You have 30 weight, 50 weight, and buttonhole twist. Buttonhole twist is fairly self-explanatory. It's used for making hand-stitched buttonholes. It can also be used for very obvious and intentional top stitching. It's also a great thread for stitching on buttons or doing other reinforcements that can be fairly chunky. For the 30 weight and the 50 weight, it follows the same principle as our fabrics do in the fact that the 50 weight is the lighter weight version. The 30 weight is heavier. 50 weight is a very fine, thin sewing thread, and that's great if you are, say, working on a silk garment or doing lighter weight stitches, something that you don't want to be terribly visible. It's great for humming with. I use that thread for stitching so many different things. However, I probably use the 30 weight more. The 30 weight in reality is what I tend to use for my buttonhole stitches, for my seaming because it's a little bit stronger, for any sort of top stitching that I want to be remotely visible. And I especially always across the board use it in stitching in my sleeves. If you were going to hand stitch one seam in your entire garment, make it stitching in your sleeves. This is still regularly used in nice tailoring today. Even when they are machine stitching almost nearly the entire garment, they will still hand stitch the sleeves in. If they are not able to do that, they will very often use a chain stitching machine. It's because both of these things allow more flexibility. So you don't end up with a super rigid line that goes around the arm because you're moving so much. You want it to have some flexibility and give. So that is my one recommendation that you take away from all of the things when it comes to stitching with certain threads. Use 30 weight silk sewing thread to stitch in all of your sleeves with a nice back stitch. Our bonus content for the video today has to do with the other sorts of supplies you might need, your tools. 
There are a few specific types of tools that I really recommend if you're getting into tailoring or honestly, historic sewing in general. First off, a good set of tailor's chalk, not the waxy stuff that you can get at most of the large fabric stores. That stuff does not come off. You mark it once, you have no hope, especially when it's wax-based and you're working on say a silk that will set in and stain your silk permanently. Avoid the wax. Also avoid waxing your threads if you're working on silk for the same reason. It will actually stain things permanently once you apply heat, just FYI. But when it comes to Taylor's chalk, you can get it in white and other colors. It just needs to be a nice pure chalk. And that is just useful across the board. You might also want a tailor square, or if you aren't quite ready to invest in something that specific, because it's really useful for drafting, but less so for general usage, I pretty much exclusively use a quilter's rule. It's just a large clear ruler that has a square system marked out on it. And that allows me to make sure that I'm squared up with different lines. I got mine from my grandmother. I don't know why she had it, she never quilted, but it has been probably the most useful tool in my entire sewing arsenal for my entire adult life. I've also had a lot of people ask me about my shears. I definitely recommend getting a decent pair of shears, not scissors. The difference is that shears are supposed to run flat against a surface, so the handles are cocked off to the side versus scissors where they are evenly spaced. It's so much easier to cut fabric with shears. And it is so much easier if you're dealing with heavier weight tailored suitings or wools or canvas or anything to have a decent hefty pair of shears. It does not need to be the most amazing, nice, grand, expensive ones out there, but it's definitely something that is a worthwhile investment if you're going to do sewing of any type. Along the same lines, we also have what you guys seem to be very curious about when I use them, my buttonhole scissors. You can also get buttonhole chisels, which I really love buttonhole chisels and I will prefer using those. However, buttonhole scissors are great if you're sitting on the sofa, if you're traveling, or if you're just working with something super lightweight and you don't necessarily need the heft of an entire chisel punching through multiple layers. So I love my buttonhole scissors. Like I said, they're great for travel. They are considered allowed for flight travel across the world because they are blunt tipped and under two inch blade. The nice thing is unlike thread scissors, they are meant to be able to go through fabric, but they are small enough to be very easily transported and be allowed anywhere. So that's why I use those so much because they are such a multi-purpose tool, even though it seems like they shouldn't be because specifically buttonholes, but who knew? Additionally, if you're doing keyhole buttonholes, you might want to look into either getting a keyhole buttonhole chisel, or in my case, I found that I preferred the little round chisels that are meant for cutting out holes or eyelets. And I tend to use a very small version of this at the end of my buttonhole and then cut straight from there. Because the eyelet buttonhole chisels have more of a teardrop shape rather than a circle in a straight line. I also get a lot of questions about my drafting paper and you're just gonna find a link to Amazon below because it's nothing that special. <laughs> I'm sure there are lots of other options out there and you can probably get them in smaller rolls, but I generally recommend if you can manage it, just get a really big roll of this and it will last you for a very long time. I do a lot of drafting and patterning and these things usually last me a few years. But that is our list of all sorts of different tailoring ingredients that you might need if you are doing a suit or any sort of historical tailoring or honestly, a lot of different types of historical sewing. Most of these things are not distinct to just men's tailoring. They are used throughout many, many different garments. Tailors did a lot more than just men's wear throughout history. And the elements of what they used were much more universal than we might realize. So there's your list. I hope that helps you understand what some of these items are and how best to use them in the future.